My name is Tasha Dror. I'm interviewing Ruth Lynn at her home. Today's date is January the 16th, 2008. What is your full name, first, middle, maiden, and married? My name is Ruth Uriel Berger Lynn. Were you named after anyone? Um, my daddy named me just from names that he picked out of the Bible. When were you born? October the 8th, 1937. Where were you born at? I was born in the living room of my home in Wiener. Did you ever have a nickname? The only other name I've been called is Ruthie. How'd you get it? I think that's just kind of common for Ruth to be called Ruthie. Do you know where your ancestors were from? I remember th them talking about my grandpa Berger being born in Switzerland and my grandmother Berger was born in Ohio. My grandmother Leach, which was mother's maiden name, was born in um, Lawrenceville, Illinois, I believe, and my grandfather Leach, no wait, that, I'm not for sure about my grandmother Leach, that was my mother that was born in, in Lawrenceville, Illinois. I'm not for sure about my grandmother, but I think she was born in Illinois too. And I'm not for sure about my grandfather, but I think they were all in that Illinois and Indiana area. Where did they settle at? And uh, let's see, my father was born in Remsen, Iowa. And then they moved to Nebraska before they came to Wiener. And my mother then lived in, in Lawrenceville, Illinois, until she moved to Indiana, and then from there to Wiener. Daddy was 10 when he moved to Wiener in, let me see, that would have been, no, wait just a second, I'm trying to think. I believe, he, I believe his folks came here in 1900, so he would have been 10 years old. And mother came here in 1914, she was born in 1900, so that would have made her 14 when she came to Wiener. Do you have any, any idea how they ended up here? Um, I remember the, what Mother told me about her parents while they came. Uh, I guess they had been farming in Indiana at the time, I believe it was, and um, they had read an article in a paper or something about land being he so rich here and and at a reasonable price, and they sold everything they had there and loaded everything on freight trains, cattle, chickens, everything on freight trains, and moved here. And, and um, Margie Huber told Helen, my sister, not too long ago, she said, did you know that, she was looking through some old records, that your grandpa Leach paid cash for his the farm he bought, and I think it was just kind of um, west of Waldenburg a little bit. But they first, now that was the Grandpa Leach. Um, now they lived north of Wiener for a while in a big two-story house there. Um, it burned, and I'm not for sure. In the picture, Mother looks like she's probably about 20 at that time when that picture was taken. So I'm not for sure whether they were living in, I'm, I'm almost sure they were living in Wiener first and I don't know if that was their first house they lived in and then later he bought that farm in Waldenburg. I should have paid more attention to stories mother told. <laughs> Can you tell me a story? And, and I think my, I don't think my Grandpa Berger ever made it down here but my grandmother Berger came and lived with my Uncle George out on the farm. But I think they were all farmers by trade. Can you tell me a story about your mom? Oh goodness, I got many stories about mama. Um, one story I remember, she, she taught Sunday school. And um, this one particular lesson she was working on and she said, you know, she said, this is just going to be such a difficult lesson to, to teach. And I said, well, why? She said, well, it's all about sins like cheating and lying and adultery and, 
and envy and things like that. And she said, you know, there's not anybody in my class that does any of those things. So that's just the kind of person she was. She thought everybody was just good, you know. Nobody, no, nobody in her class did those sins. <laughs> and so, and then... Um, do you think of another one about when uh, her when you were that you remember about her when you were a girl? Oh, I remember one time I had been just deathly sick. I had had whooping cough and double pneumonia and uh, just nearly died and, and this was in the winter and, and spring came and it was a, I was getting over all of this and I finally kinda quit coughing so much and it was a real pretty day and, and the sun was shining, but it had rained the day before. And there were little puddles everywhere. And I was about, I guess I was seven. And I just begged to go outside. It had been so long since I'd been outside and got to do anything. And uh, so I said, well, okay, you can go out, but you just be sure and not step in any mud puddles. Of course, the first thing I did when I went out <laughs> was find me some mud puddles. And I was just having a good time in those mud, pu mud puddles till I saw Mama coming and she always spanked me with a boot strap. And here she came with that boot strap. And I thought, ooh, I've had it now. And I started running and I ran around and around the house. I ran around the house about <clears throat> four or five times and finally I just wore Mama completely out. So she went in the house and Daddy was in there. And she was so mad and she told Daddy to come out there and do something with me and told him what I'd done and he just brought me in and just got, made up some water and started cleaning me all up and it didn't spank me or anything and so then mama was even madder at him than she was at me because I didn't get a licking like I should have had for doing something that I wasn't supposed to do. Doesn't that sound just like me? <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell me a story about your dad? Um, well, let's see. I'll tell one that's just kind of related to him first of all. Of course, that story was kind of about Daddy too. But he was real, he told me this story, that he was just really deeply in debt and was having a hard time paying off everything. So he decided that maybe it was because he hadn't been tithing that maybe that was the way the Lord was punishing him. So he started just faithfully tithing every Sunday and everything started looking brighter and he started being able to pay off his debts and got them all paid off and he just kept tithing till the day he died. He just swore that was the reason that he had gotten himself in that trouble and that was exactly the reason he got out of that financial problem. And. Uh, I don't remember quite as much about my dad as my older brothers, uh, my older brother and my sisters knew, because by the time I came along, he was uh, 47 when I was born. So he had, um, and and he was ill a lot of that time, and so I don't have a whole lot of re memories of things that we did together like my older sisters do. They can tell you story after story. <laughs> Mel Helen will tell about how she had run to meet him when he was coming in from work and and he'd throw her up on his shoulders and and come on home and then she'd get in his lunch box to see if there's anything left. She said even if it was a crust of bread, she's glad to get it, you know, and she would eat that and she'd tell how he would um, let her stand on her feet and, and uh, teach her how to waltz. I guess he was quite a dancer in his younger days and liked to call square dancing. I've heard he was just a great uh, square dance caller and uh, he was he was quite the, the man about town I think when he was younger from what I hear. Life, life, life of the party. <laughs> but he kind of gotten over that by the time I remember him. Do you know when your parents got married? They got married in February of 1920. How did they earn their living? Daddy was a carpenter, mother was the housewife. What are some important things that you learned from your parents? Mm -hmm. 
Well, um, I, I guess my main thing I learned from my parents was um, to have a strong faith. One thing that was for sure is that we always went to Sunday school, church, night, morning, Wednesdays, whenever the church doors were open, we were expected to be there. And um, of course, when you're growing up, sometimes you resent that a little bit, but now I can appreciate it mm -hmm. because it has made me have a strong faith. And uh, that's probably the best lesson that I learned. Of course, Mother was a um, very patient and kind person, so I probably learned a little of that from, from her too because uh, I feel like I have quite a lot of patience. And, Hopefully, a lot of kindness, too. <laughs> <laughs> what were the names of your grandparents on your mother's side? My grandmother's name was Ada Leach, and my grandfather's name was Albert Leach. What did they do for a living? She was the housewife, and he was a farmer. What was their house like? Um, the house that I remember a picture of was a white, two-story house with a front porch all the way across the front. And it was the one that was just north of Wiener. And that's the only one that I ever saw a picture of. Now, my, my, I never really, um, both my grandparents on my father's side were, had died before I was even born. And uh, my grandfather Leach died before I was born. He, was, he died in 1932. And my grandmother, Leach, died when I was just seven. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I didn't really have um, many memories of grandparents either. I can remember the kids at school would be talking about going to grandma's house over the weekend and what all they did and, and what all they had to eat and, and all that. And I can remember being so envious because I didn't have any grandparents to go visit. Mm -hmm. And I, it would just make me feel so sad because I didn't have any grandparents to go visit. So I don't have those good memories that a lot of people have. How many kids did they have? My grandmother, Leach, had nine children. She, three, three died at one is an infant and the other two is children, and I'm not for sure exactly what. One of them fell in a tub of, of scalding water when they were doing a wash pot out in the yard. Mm -hmm. I remember Mother telling me that, mm -hmm. but I'm not for sure about the other two. That just sort of stuck in my memory. Mm -hmm. And uh, then so uh, the other six lived to adulthood and beyond. What were the names of your grandparents on your father's side? My grandmother's name was Catherine, and my grandfather's name was Christian Berger. What did they do for a living? And they farmed, and she was a housewife. What was their house like? You know, I'm really not for sure, but mm -hmm. I think the house that they had in Wiener would have been the house that Uncle George had out on his farm. And I remember it being just kind of a white, small house. I don't think it was two-story. When I remembered, it might have been at one time, but what I remember was not. And um, so I'm, I'm not for sure what, what it was like. So it was common that it was a housewife and farming back then. The men farmed, right, right. women mm -hmm. housewife. Mm -hmm. How many kids did your father's? Let's see. I think have? she had um, one girl and one, two, three, six boys. So she had seven, seven children. What do you remember most about them? Um, that would have been my aunts and uncles. Let's see. Well, um, Uncle Kenneth ended up uh, farming out in the Harrisburg community. And um, one thing I remember, and this was after I was grown, and we were already living out here, 
skunks got underneath their house and dogs got after them and just made their house smell something terrible. And they couldn't stand to live it anymore. So they came out here and stayed with us for, I don't know, it seemed like about a month before their house cleared out enough that they could move back in it. And my uncle Stanley, now these are our, our mother's brothers. Um, he used to come over and, and duck hunt with Bobby a lot. And when he came, we only had the one bedroom, so the girls would have to make pallets on the floor or something. Uh, so he, he told Bobby, he said, well, if you'll furnish the material, I'll just build me a little uh, apartment back here behind this garage. So Bobby said, that would be a good idea. And so we call it our bunkhouse. And it has come in so handy so many times. Mm -hmm. um, Uncle Kenneth and that family lived out there when the skunks got in their house. Um, in 1968, Mama's and Daddy's house burned in Wiener. And so they lived out here for a while. Mm -hmm. And when Bobby's that possum, Uncle Lauren moved back from, from Flint, Michigan, they lived out there while they were getting their house built just down the road from us here. Mm -hmm. And uh, then when we were remodeling our house, we lived out there for a while. <laughs> so it's really come, that bunkhouse has really come in handy. And then when the girls had bunking parties, we could just put them out there and, and stick food out there and you never had to bother <laughs> with them anymore. <laughs> Can you tell me a story about any of your paternal grandparents? Um, I really don't know any stories myself. I can tell you one that I can tell you one that Dorothy told me. Okay. Uh, you know, we were always used to when Mama cooked, we were in the kitchen with her, mm -hmm. and if she made cake, we licked the bowls and licked the icing bowls and and uh, all like that. And Dorothy said that. Mother had appendicitis and had to go to the hospital for a, a surgery, and Grandma Berger came and kept them while she was in the hospital. And she said, what I remember most about her is that she shut that kitchen door and locked it and wouldn't let us come in there. And she didn't get to lick any cake bowls or ice and bowls. And she said what she remembers both about how she looked was that her hands were all gnarled and, and probably had rheumatoid arthritis, I figure, because she said they were all gnarled and out of shape. But I've, I didn't see her, either one of them, so I don't have any personal stories about them. What about your brothers and, brothers and sisters? I had one brother, and um, he was um, drafted into the Army. He was 19, he was going to college at the time, and um, he was shipped overseas and was in Germany and was shot by a sniper that was in a, a steeple of a church and killed. What was his name? And his name was Winfred, Winfred Samuel Winfred Berger. And um, he was buried in a cemetery in McGrotten Holland. And when it, the war was over and soldiers could be brought back home. Uh, Mama just chose to not to not do that. The, the, we've got pictures of the cemetery and it's beautiful and both my sisters Catherine and Dorothy both have been there and they say it's just a wonderful place. They've got a big memorial um, out front they call the reflection pool with water and a big monument and at the time that he was buried there, different Dutch girls were assigned different graves to take care of. And this girl's name was Maria, and she wrote to Mother, but she could only write in German. Of course, Mother couldn't read German, but at that time there was a Catholic nun. We had a Catholic school mm -hmm. here at Wiener at that time, and there was one of the nuns that could speak and read and write German. So Mother would take the letters up to her and she'd translate them for her. And so Mother would write to Maria and she had someone who could translate Mother's language into German so that she could read them. 
and they corresponded until mother died and after mother died uh, my sister Catherine got a hold of of uh, Maria and she and her husband went to Holland and visited in their home with them and so they have kept in touch and then Maria passed away and her daughter Hilda took over just where Maria had left off and and they would put flowers for on Memorial Day on the graves mm -hmm. and uh, now she passed away this past winter so I'm not for sure what what will happen now but I'm I'm just assuming probably someone else will take over that duty but and there's someone there at the uh, I guess you would call the office of the cemetery mm -hmm. and Catherine said that when they went there that they were so tickled to have somebody there and that all the people there are so appreciative of Americans for what they did said that they would not be a, a free country now if it had not been for the United States so they they really appreciate the American people mm -hmm. who kept the letters or who were, what happened to the letters that your mother had I've got them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In fact, I was reading. I I had one that I was reading when I was looking for some photographs that Mother had written to Winford and obviously had been sent back to her because it had deceased written on it. And I got so tickled when I read one thing. She said that she had been to Jonesboro and she had bought me a pair, a really pretty pair of patent leather shoes. And she told Winford in the letter, she said, you know, I paid $4.50 for him, and I thought that was rather expensive. But she said, I could have gotten some ration shoes for $2.50. But she said, those shoes just fall apart. <laughs> when growing up with your brothers and sisters, how did you get along with them? Well, I got along real well with them because by the time I was in the sixth grade, I was like an only child. I was the only one left at home because I came along kind of late in, in Mama's and Daddy's life. So one of those uh, unexpected surprises. And uh, uh, I think Mother didn't know what she would do with another one, but she found out that she um, had a lot of use for me after she got a little older. <laughs> but um, Helen would have been the one that was next to me, and she was six years older than me. Mm -hmm. So, and she married as soon as she got out of high school. So from the sixth grade on, I was at home by myself. And the, the most I remember, of course, would be about Helen. And she used to call me her shadow because everywhere she went, I made sure I went too, if I possibly could at all. Even if she went across the street to borrow something from Miss Wright, I would go along too, just because I wanted to, to be a tag along. So, and even, it, we had an outdoor toilet at that time because we didn't have running water. So even when she went to the toilet, I tagged along. So one day, she decided she'd just fix me. And I don't know whether you know what persimmons are, but when they're green, they are as bitter as gall. And, and I would do just anything she told me to do. So she was sitting there using the bathroom, and I was standing there waiting for her. <laughs> she said, Ruthie, if you'll close your eyes and open your mouth, I'm going to give you something really good. So, of course, I closed my eyes, and I opened my mouth big, and she popped that green persimmon in there, and I chomped down on it, and oh, my gosh, my mouth just turned inside out. It tasted so horrible. <laughs> of course, I went crying to Mama, you know. And I think she got a little bit of a spat over that because I don't think Mama thought that was too funny either. <laughs> <laughs> and and I would sneak her, her love letters and read those, and I'd remember every word it said, you know, so when she'd start saying something, I could remind her of what that letter said. And uh, I'd always want to walk with... Christine Bradley lived down the road from us, and she and Chris, Helen and Christine always walked to school together. And so... I would always walk with them. Well, they kind of got tired of that, and they started just dwaddling along and being late for school. 
and I couldn't stand to be late for school. You know, I thought that was just horrible because I was still in grade school then. And I thought that was just unheard of. So they do that trying to make me go on, you know. But instead of that, I just told Mama on her again. And Mama made her start getting to school on time. And, <laughs> and, and you, you know, Helen says that I was spoiled, and I can't imagine how she ever came up with that. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do for fun together? Oh, we were always game players. That's, you know, we liked to play cards. We liked playing Monopoly. Mm -hmm. And um, now I didn't, I was kind of little and didn't get in on this, but uh, just south of our house, that was a vacant lot. And they kept that scraped off and they made a tennis court out there. Mm -hmm. And I can remember watching them play, and, but they never did really let me be in on the game because I was too little. Mm -hmm. But. Uh, they had, a, it was a, kind of a round drum of a thing that had little holes all around it that they put lime in to mark the, the lines of the tennis court. Mm -hmm. And they'd have to do that every once in a while if it rained or if they walked on it too much or anything. So they played a lot of tennis that I, that I got to watch some of. Where was yeah. that located? You know where, um, um, I'll just go to the next okay. one. Okay, go ahead the tennis court. Where was it? Okay. Uh, oh, the tennis court was um, <clears throat> over where Bobby McAvoy lives now, just south. I think that would be south of us, mm -hmm. on that lot right there. Mm -hmm. And then we would always set up a croquet court on the north side of the house and play croquet. I remember playing croquet a lot. And then we played games um, like Annie Over. Uh, that was one of our favorite ones, to play Annie Over. But most of the time it was kind of like, like card games or Monopoly or things like that mm -hmm. in the winter time. What's the most trouble you've ever gotten into? Hmm. Well, I've already told the one about walking into mud puddles. Another thing that I did that Mother didn't really approve of, I got tired of that little old bootstrap. So I decided <laughs> one day that Mama had, at, at that time she was, uh, cooking on a coal oil cook stove. Mm -hmm. And I just decided that it was time to get rid of that, so I just put it in the oven. <laughs> of course, when Mama lit the oven, you know what happened, it melted the <laughs> bootstrap and made a horrible stink all over the house. And the bad part about it is she found another one. <laughs> so it didn't do me any good to burn that one. <laughs> and let's see, another time that I can remember when I was little, was um, she had sent, I had gone down to play with um, Joanne Ship, and, and uh, she sent Helen to bring me home. Well, I was, wasn't ready to come home yet. I wasn't through playing. So I just kept on playing and ignored it all, you know. And after, I, I figured probably maybe an hour, I decided I might have gone home. But I thought, well, you know, I'm probably going to be in trouble, so I'm just going to crawl up here. Mama has some rabbit hutches in the backyard, but she didn't have any rabbits yet. But I thought, I'll just crawl up in here and I'll hide until she forgets about having sent for me. Yeah. So it seemed like I just stayed up there forever, and it was probably not over 10 minutes, but it felt, felt like I was up there forever. And I finally thought it was safe to come down and uh, that she wouldn't remember. but. You know how mothers are. She happened to remember, so I I got a licking for that too, and that was probably my three times and with that I can remember being really in in bad trouble. And I'm sure that I was a pain in the neck as a teenager, but I can't ever remember just being in a whole lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, about the only thing you could do then, you know, they didn't have drugs at that time. You might, you could drink a beer or something like that or smoke a cigarette, but I never was inclined to do that. In fact, my, my smoking career started and ended in one day. And I'll tell you a story about that. <laughs> uh, Leona Mead used to be Gardner Down, and I were really good friends. And, 
And her daddy smoked. And one day she had this pack of cigarettes and she said, let's just hide these and someday we'll smoke them. And I said, oh, that's a good idea. So we put them in a fruit jar and hid them underneath her porch. Well, one day they had them out in their yard. They had built this cement pond for goldfish. It was a square pond, probably about six feet square or something like that. But it was empty, and they had a tarp over it, and it was all cleaned out. So I, had, I was at Leona's. We were probably about the fourth grade, probably. And uh, so we decided it was time to try those cigarettes out. So we got down in that hole with that tarp over us, and we lit up those cigarettes and started smoking them, and it got so smoky in there we'd about choked to death. <laughs> so we decided right then and there that that was the end of our smoking career, and I never did try it after that. <laughs> of course, Mama didn't even know that, or she'd probably gotten me for that too. <laughs> but uh, that was my experience with, with smoking. <laughs> Tell me more about other people in your family or a really close family friend of your parents when you were young. Well, let's see. My older sister, Dorothy, is 15 years older than I am. So um, I can remember going to her house after she had married, and uh, she had a daughter that was just six years older than me. And I can remember going there, and when she'd make a dress for her daughter, she'd just go ahead and make me one too. And um, I kind of looked to her more as a mama figure than a sister figure because she was that much older than me. And um, my sister Alice, uh, what I remember about her when I was young, she, she had uh, already graduated and gone to Drons Business College over in Memphis and had gotten a job over there. And I always just couldn't wait for her to come home because she would always bring me something. And I remember she brought me a book one time that I just thought was the best book I ever, ever had. It was called Miss Sniff, and it was about a little black kitten. And it had that flocked finish, you know, on the cat that you could rub and feel. And I thought, oh, that was just the most wonderful book. And then she gave me the cutest little books. They were called Little Brown Coco. And it was brought a little black boy, and I've still got those books. And, and she bought me two or three of those books. And then as I got a little older, she started getting me Bobsy Twin books. So I got a whole big volume of Bobsy Twin books. And um, a neat story about Alice is um, when, when my, my brother Winfred was in the service, when he would write to Mama, he would talk about this buddy whose name was Bob Collins. And uh, so after, after he was killed, Mama thought, well, she would just write a letter to Bob with Winford's address and see if he'd get it. And sure enough, he did. And he started writing to Mama then. And when, he, when the war ended and he came home, he stopped by our house before he went on home on his way home and visited, and Alice happened to be home that weekend. Well, he kind of took a liking to Alice, I guess, because they started writing letters. And then he came another time or two, and um, then she went up there and met his parents. So um, they had quite a, a romance going and finally married. Oh. And so I thought that was a neat story of <clears throat> how they met and and married, and of course she then settled in Lamar's, Iowa, and had they had three boys. So I always thought that was such a neat neat love story. <laughs> and of course Helen just thought I was a pest, but she loved me anyway. <laughs> yeah. And Winfred. That, it, the, the, the thing that sticks out in my mind about Winfred is he was riding me on, on a bicycle one time. I was on the back, and I, I must have been probably about five years old, probably. But anyway, I wasn't watching what I was doing, and I got my heel caught in the spokes and just tore my heel up. 
and I can remember how, how scared he was. Boy, he rushed me home in a hurry. And uh, of course, I know that the, the remedies are different then than they are now. The first thing Mama would do if you had a cut on your foot or somewhere was stick it in coal oil. And so she stuck that foot in coal oil and soaked it good and then bandaged it up. And, and um, I don't even have a scar from it now and it just about tore my whole heel off. So that must have had some good healing powers in it. <laughs> Were there some of your relatives or family friends that people thought were strange or a bit odd? Um, oh, I can remember talking about Uncle Austin. He got very uh, radically religious. He didn't think women should cut their hair and you weren't supposed to wear your dresses above your ankles and, and uh, just a lot of no, wear no makeup and no fingernail polish and don't, you know, all that. So they always thought he was a little different from all the rest of them. <laughs> what did the house you lived in as a child look like? I even have the house plans of, of, of that house. It was um, had a had a front porch all the way across the front and a, had a back porch all the way across the back with a little addition on it. We even had indoor water because our pump was in that little addition so you didn't have to go outside to pump your water. Of course, we didn't have running water, but we had it handier than it being out in the yard, you know, because it was right there on the porch. And, uh, and of course, Mother um, had an old ringer wash machine that she had out there on the porch that she did her washing on. We had um, it had, let me see, a living room, a dining room, a kitchen, and three bedrooms. And of course, it, when it was built, there was no bath. And hard, no, not many closets, because houses back in those, I think it was built, seems like it was built in the 20s, I think. So closets were not really heard of too much then. And uh, then later, when it was re redone, then they added a bathroom and some closets. Then in 1968, it burned really bad. It, uh, there was some some framework left in it, and uh, but it was it was charred and everything on the inside was just charred and a mess and. <coughs> The, the neat thing was, though, that um, Benny Ritter's father-in-law was a carpenter, and <coughs> Mother, uh, I don't know how she found out that Benny might be interested in it, but Benny said that he could um, go ahead and fix it up, and I think he offered to buy it or something, but I think she just gave it to him because she knew that they couldn't. Daddy was not in any health then to do any kind of work. And she knew that it, it'd probably be as expensive to fix it up as it would be to just build a new one. So Benny had it moved over and he redid it and made a really nice house out of it. So um, I thought that was kind of a, a neat story too. But she did, was able to save some pictures that were up in the top of a closet um, there were all the one bedroom suit was was saved. It could be refinished and saved. But uh, the piano that she had had since she was, I think, twelve years old was ruined. She had a great big round dining room table that everybody just loved, and it was ruined. And uh, I know. Uh, one of the girls, I can't remember which one, was really wanting to have a library table that had claws, glass with claws over it, mm -hmm. and um, it was ruined. And the reason the fire started was because Me Melanie was there, our daughter, mm -hmm. our younger daughter, and she loved french fries. Mm -hmm. So mother had put on some oil or grease to make french fries, 
and, and um, the, the wonderful world of Disney was coming on, and Melanie always liked that. And so she was sitting there and watching that with Melanie and forgot about her her grease bin on her stove, and it caught on fire, and that's what caused the house to burn. It just went pretty fast after it started. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> What was your neighborhood like where you lived as a child? Well, um, we had... Um, we had a neighbor across the street was Mr. and Miss Wright, and their children were all a little bit older than than I was. And then a, I had a Catherine Mayfield was close to my age, and they were over on another corner. So she was a good playmate of mine. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the Ship family li lived about a block away from us, and and they had a daughter Joanne that 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 I played with a lot. And we had Miss Rankin on, and her family that lived next door to us, and all of their children were older too. So, mm -hmm. but it was a it was a nice neighborhood. Everybody visited everybody, and and uh, like like I say, if 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 Miss Wright needed a cup of sugar and didn't have it, she'd come over and borrow it. Or if we needed something that we didn't have, we'd run over and borrow from her. And so we had we had a good neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Do you remember going shopping with your mom as a child? Mm -hmm. We shopped. Um, I, I, I did a lot of things with mother because, like I say, uh, most of the time I was the only one there. And But she didn't, she would buy, buy material to make me dresses. When I was little, I, uh, a, home, a button dress was kind of unheard of. She made all my clothes. Made all my doll clothes, and uh, in fact, some of my clothes were even made out of flower sacks. Uh, they used to get flour in in printed sacks, and some of the prints were real pretty, you mm -hmm. know. So I even had quite a few dresses that were made out of flower sacks. Oh, that would be neat. Uh huh. And uh, and um, when we'd grow grocery shopping, she'd usually have just a little money for me to get a little candy with or, or something. And uh, uh, later, at, when I became a teenager, every once in a while, well, we'd go shopping and buy, buy bought and clothes, but mm -hmm. uh, she still made a lot of my clothes even as a teenager. Do you still have the dresses that were made out of the flower sack. Mm -hmm. I don't have any anymore. I hate that too. I should have saved one of them. <laughs> Do you remember what the stores looked like? Well, I remember um, Mr. D. Good had a grocery store. Mm -hmm. It's where the city hall is now. And um, there was a, there was Miss Sophie Sishler. She had kind of a, like a five and dime store. Mm -hmm. And um, Bryant's, Roy Bryant and Stell had a, a drugstore with a soda fountain in it. And I think there was a pool table in that too. And uh, Harry Gilmore had a barber shop along there. And um, um, Arlie and Irene McCoy had a restaurant mm -hmm. um, along in there. And uh, let's see, Willa Dean Hesse had, mm -hmm. had a, a beauty shop mm -hmm. along there too. In my, in my more like ten years was our beauty shop there. Mm -hmm. uh, there was Lucille Vandiver had a beauty shop, kind of where Perkins Body Shop is now, over in that yeah. part of the block. And when I was a little girl, because I can remember they had these machines that had all these wires hanging down from the machine mm -hmm. that had things on them that that you curled your hair on mm -hmm. to get permanents. Yeah. And I can remember getting a perm down on one of those machine things one time. Kind of scary looking, you know, when you were little to, yeah. to look at that. How much did that cost to get that done? Oh, my gee, I can't remember, but I bet you, I bet you it wasn't over a dollar if it was that much. <laughs> because everything was really cheap, yeah. you know. Even as a teenager, you could buy a hamburger for a quarter, <clears throat> you know. Yeah, compared to the, these days right now. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. What kinds of things would your mother usually buy at the store? Oh, she didn't. She she was a, a pretty conservative person, so she didn't buy 
much of anything but what was necessary, mm -hmm. you know, necessary groceries <clears throat> and and uh, just just what just what we kind of had to have. Needed, she, not really what you wanted. Um, we actually um, probably didn't even demand too much mm -hmm. at that time, you know, like like kids do today. We yeah. probably never even thought about. Uh, begging for for a lot of things, we mm -hmm. probably just knew it was out of the question anyway. You yeah. know. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Did you get to buy anything? Um, every once in a while, she'd give me a little bit of money to buy some candy or something with. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you remember any stories your older family members used to tell you? Um. I just remember some stories that my older sisters, you know, have told. Mm -hmm. um, I think I told the one about Catherine, Dorothy, and, and the grandmother Berger. Uh, uh, a, kind of a funny story she told about Uncle George was every Christmas until he married, <laughs> he would always bring them presents for Christmas and he always bought a fruit basket. And Dorothy said that they'd usually have a, a service at uh, the church on Christmas Eve, mm -hmm. and that Mama would have Christmas Eve supper, and then she'd just put a tablecloth over all the food, and they'd go to this service. And while they were there, Uncle George would come, and he'd take all the food and take it into the kitchen and put presents under there mm -hmm. and for them to have when they came back home. And Dorothy said she remembered the the... Mm -hmm last Christmas that she ever got a present from him was um, she he bought she and Alice both a new coat and hers was tan with a fur collar on it mm -hmm. and Alice's was red and she thought that was just the most beautiful coat she'd ever had but she said after Uncle George got married that ended the Christmas presents <laughs> Do you remember going to your first funeral that you attended? The first person that I remember um, seeing in a coffin was my grandmother Leach. Mm -hmm. um, I was just getting, that was the same year I had that whooping cough and double pneumonia, so I was just kind of getting over that. And But mother said, well, that she would take me to the funeral home but she didn't want to take me to the funeral because I was still doing all that coughing and everything. So I did go to the funeral home, mm -hmm. and uh, that was my first experience with anything to do with funerals. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can remember, I can still remember what, what it looked like because that was quite impressive for me to see somebody that was laying in a, in a casket like that. Mm -hmm. I was seven at the time. When you were younger, were your parents very strict? They didn't seem to be too strict. Um, of course, I knew, I kind of knew what my limits were, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but um, Mama was the one that was more of a disciplinarian than Daddy was. Mm -hmm. uh, and. Uh, you know, as far as having certain times to to be home, I knew that I couldn't stay out too late as a teenager. Mm -hmm. You know, in the weekdays, I knew I was had to be in probably close to 10 and probably close to 12 on the weekends and, yeah. and things like that. What were some of your household rules? Mm -hmm. You know, I can't really remember any specific rules that we had. So uh, it was, you know, like I say, since I was the only one there, we probably didn't have as many rules mm -hmm. as if there were a bunch of us. Because I can't remember really having any hard, fast rules that we had to go by. Mm -hmm. Did you have any chores that you had to do, like an everyday thing? Um, I think when I was smaller, I didn't really have to do too much because I had other people that pretty well did most of those. I did mm -hmm. do dishes once in a while, but it wasn't an everyday thing. But as I got older, um, I would help clean house every Saturday when mm -hmm. when I was in school. We'd 
we'd, I'd have to help clean house, but I didn't have any real specific chores. <clears throat> what did your family do to have fun together? Um, we played games. We, we played Monopoly and we played a lot of card games. And um, Always had big, big family dinners. Uh, even after, you know, the girls had married and moved off, most of them, but they, they came home quite often. And Mama would always cook up a big Sunday dinner and they'd come for, for dinner. And, and, uh, and that's probably the... Did y'all ever go on trips? You know, we didn't. No, we didn't. It was, it was really rare if we went, went anywhere. Now, Mother and I went to Alice's a few times when I was little. We rode the train uh, and, and went to visit Alice. And one time when we were in, in Iowa visiting Alice, um, we went over to see the wife of one of Daddy's older brothers and uh, spent a few th days there. But that's probably, and then we had an, I had an Aunt Nanny on my mother's, my daddy's side, it was daddy's sister, that lived in Cape Girada that we went to see every once in a while. And um, my grandmother Leach remarried after Grandpa De Leach died, and she moved to Goobertown. <laughs> and we went up there every once in a while to visit her. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, the only thing I the only thing I can much remember about her house there was that she had this cellar that she kept all of her her canned goods and potatoes and things like that in, and there was a creek that ran down by her house that we liked to play in. Mm -hmm. and we liked playing that old cellar. Did you ever have any family pets? We always had cats. But for some reason, Daddy never did let us have dogs, and I don't know what the reason was. But we always had cats. I guess because cats would catch mice and dogs didn't catch anything. That's the only thing I can figure out. And then I raised a little baby chicken one time until <laughs> it was a hen, and it would follow me everywhere I'd go. And it would eat out of my hand, and it would jump up on my lap and let me pet its feathers and, and uh, all like that. But mostly it was cats. Mm -hmm. We always had cats. Was there a special pet that was yours when you were young, or was it just the little? Baby? Just the just the chicken, and of course I always had my own favorite cat, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you name your chicken? You know, I was trying to think of whether I I probably did, but I I was trying to think of what I had named it, and I cannot remember. What I named that, but I'm sure I named it. <laughs> what medicines or remedies do you remember as a child? Oh, okay. Well, the kerosene to soak open wounds with, and then oh, I can remember that I can't even drink Sprite to this day because it reminds me of gross chill tonic, and I took bottle after bottle of gross chill tonic. It was kind of, that was kind of a white liquid medicine. It was supposed to be for colds, I guess. And it had little white speckles in it, and it was horrible tasting. That and cocoa quinine. Oh, I don't know how much of that I took either. And it was kind of chocolatey looking, but it tasted horrible too. Mm -hmm. And uh, those those are the three main things that I can remember as being remedies. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mom also made the mule tail tea. When you had diarrhea, you drank mule tail tea. <laughs> and... Uh, so those were some of the, the old, old remedies that I, I can remember, too. Can you remember a time you or someone else in your family was very sick or hurt? Ooh, I can remember when I was <laughs> sick. I've said this time and time. When I, had that, I missed six weeks of school when I had that d double pneumonia and whooping cough. Mm -hmm. And I can remember just, being, just coughing until I, I thought I would die. You know, I couldn't get my breath. That's a horrible disease to have. And uh, then when I had that pneumonia on top of it, it really, I was really, really sick. 
And that's the sickest I've ever been. Mm -hmm. so, well, when I had Micah, I also was deathly ill. Um, I developed, I, I don't think they call it this now. I'm not for sure what they call it now. They called it toxemia at the time. And um, they, they were really kind of scared about my life at that point, too. But I pulled through that, too. <laughs> was there a doctor there to... I was in the hospital, even. At uh, that time, well, but now the doctor that I had when I had whooping cough was Dr. Alcott. He had an office there in in Wiener, mm -hmm. and uh, of course he'd make house calls too. You know, mm -hmm. at that time doctors made house calls all the time. There was that doctor that um, I do we doctored with some, and then there was a doctor down at Hickory Ridge that would come up, Dr. Hickman. Mm -hmm. I remember when I thought. Well, I thought it was just a bad stomach ache, and Bobby and Mama called Dr. Hickman up there, and he sent me to the hospital, and I had appendicitis. Mm -hmm. So uh, Dr. Hickman was another one. When you when you had uh, pneumonia, did they have antibiotics then? I you don't remember? think so. I I just remember taking gross chill tonic and cocoa <coughs> I don't remember taking any antibiotics. What mm -hmm. hospital did you go to? Do you remember the name of it? When I went for my appendix, it was St. Bernard's. St. Bernard's. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When you were a child in elementary school, what was your school like? You know, um, I've got a picture of the school. At that time, there was a two-story building. Mm -hmm. And um, the grade school was in the bottom part of it, and the high school was in the top part of the same building. Mm -hmm. And um, we had... Um, I think at times there were two grades in a room, but a lot of times it was just single grades because I can remember just being having a first grade teacher. Her name was Miss Inez Norsworthy. And what I loved to do when I was in her class, we didn't have a cafeteria, so we had to take our lunch. But she was living with Miss Walford at the time, and Miss Walford was living in the house that Louie and Hogue lives in now that's just right across the road from school. And every day, she would let one of us go over to Miss Wofford's and bring a plate lunch back to her. Mm -hmm. And it was such a thrill to get to go over to Miss Wofford's and get that plate lunch and bring back to Miss Inez. So that was one of my highlights in the first grade. My, my worst year was probably the second grade. I was a real good friend of Ruby Jean Jones, and Miss Ruby was our teacher. And that was not a good year to pick a teacher's daughter, I don't believe, for a friend. Because we were always getting in trouble. The only time I ever got spanked was in, was in the second grade. And she'd turn, what she would do, she'd get a ruler and she'd turn the palm of your hand up and she'd spat your hand with that ruler good, you know. And I got my hand spanked a few times. And then she stood us in the, the corner a lot too for talking. and. There was a bookcase at the back of the room, and she was, at first she would stick Ruby Jean on one end of that bookcase and me on the other until she discovered that we were talking behind the bookcase. And then she started putting us in one end of the room and the other one in the other end of the room. Mm -hmm. So that was kind of a rough year, because I got in trouble a lot that year. Mm -hmm. What was the name of your school that you went to? It was Wiener Elementary School. Mm -hmm. Can you think of a story you could tell me about something that happened to you at grade school? Okay, I've told you those two. Oh, and Miss May was just my all-time favorite teacher. She was just the sweetest thing. And you know, it's funny that you remember things that really has nothing to do with academics the best. But um, I know she was the one that would let us in the mornings, we'd have opening exercise, and she'd let us sing songs. And, and I can remember standing up there and singing, um, Don't Fence Me In, and, and I was born in Kansas and bred in Kansas, and Sioux City Sioux, and some of those <laughs> songs. We just loved to do that, you know. And uh, the, the, the one project that I remember we had to do, um, a map of all the states, and we had to glue a product from that state, you know, on the 
on the map, and I thought that was neat. When I got it all finished, it looked real neat. I should have kept it, and I don't have that either. But I thought that looked real neat. But Miss May was just always such a kind, sweet person, and she just loved everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, it didn't matter who you were, she just loved you, and you knew it. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't anybody that she loved any more than, than she did anybody else, you know. She was just that kind of sweet person. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was just one of my favorite favorite teachers. During the summer when there was no school, what, what did you do to entertain yourself? Well, you just made up your own fun because it, you didn't have TV, you know, or Nintendo and all those things. So you just made your own fun. Daddy made me some stilts and we walked stilts and we, and we turned barrels on the side and walked barrels. And, uh, um, of course, we always had dolls that we played, and we would get, we'd get uh, old pieces of wood and and mark out rooms and build benches out of rocks and put boards on them and and uh, make make our own furniture, you know, mm -hmm. and and we always had swings. Every, every yard had a swing that we could swing. And we'd jump board. We'd get an old board and we'd put it over a block of wood or something mm -hmm. and, and jump board. And um, I know one time I was jumping board with Elma Faye McKnight and I was kind of slow about growing up. I, I stayed little for a long time and some of my friends kind of shot up faster than I did. Mm -hmm. She was a year older than I was and she was quite a bit bigger than I was. And we were jumping, and boy, she was really throwing me up in the air. I was just flying high. And I came down one time and landed right on the back of my head. And uh, I still had problems with my neck, and I think it was from that very, very fall that I had with that jump board. So when they would land and you'd fly up. Yeah. When you came back down, you tried the, to just, you you're tried standing to, up. You're standing you're up. You're standing up, and you and hit the trying, board. You're trying to land back on that Back board on that board to bounce them, them up. up. Uh -huh. them up. That's yeah. very dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. fun. Oh, it was fun. And and there was a tree that I had in, in the yard that I loved to climb. I could climb clear to the tippy top of it. The, the limbs were just right for me to climb clear to the tippy top of it. And I would sit there and just daydream and look all out over the countryside, you know. And uh, so we just kind of made our own fun. And had a, a really good time doing mm -hmm. it, you know? And, uh, and of course, we played hopscotch. Mm -hmm. We played jacks. We'd get out there on something smooth and just play jacks for hours at a time. Mm -hmm. And jump rope. And had all these little jingles that we had when we jump rope. And uh, like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all good <laughs> children go to heaven. <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> Do you? <laughs> As a kid, did you have a special hiding spot or a special place for you to go? That probably was up on the top of that tree. Because mm -hmm. that, that was kind of my special spot, was climbing way up in that tree. You know, I don't remember Mother ever being too worried about me climbing up there. And we had an old barn that you could slide off of the the roof and then jump, and it was probably up eight or 10 feet. And we'd slide off of that and jump, see how far out we could jump, you know? And I don't remember her ever cautioning us about getting hurt or anything. She just kind of let us do our thing the best I can remember. I don't ever remember her stopping me from doing any of those mm -hmm. things that I did like that. <laughs> I guess she'd had so many kids, she'd, she'd go, oh, well, to heck with it. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about the oldest person you can remember knowing when you were a child. Hmm. Well, I guess Grandma Leach would have been quite old when, and I remembered her. And then other than that, probably would just maybe been people in church, like maybe Miss Jessie. Uh, she was, she was uh, quite a bit older than Mother, I think. I think she's ten, 10 or so years older than Mother. That's about, 
that would be about the extent of it, probably. Do you remember hearing any stories about Joe Bruner? I just remember that when anybody thought he was coming to town, that everybody just made sure they kind of hid because they were afraid that he'd grab them and take them and beat them and bury them in his yard or something like that. I think that was some of the stories that were going around, that he'd beat his children and buried them in his yard or, and he might do you the same way. That's about mm -hmm. the only thing I can remember about him. But everybody was scared of old Joe Bruner. Mm -hmm. Did your mom and dad ever threaten you to give to give you to Joe Bruner? No, no, no. They never did that. <laughs> Tell me about a friend that you had when you were a child that you really liked. Oh, uh, Leona Mead, or Leona Gardner now. Uh, she and I played a lot together when we were younger. And I lived on the west side of the railroad tracks, and she lived on the east side. And this is something else we did that if probably our parents had known it, they would have thought, oh my. To, to go across, you know, we just kind of would take the shortest route. And if there was a train sitting on the track, we didn't bother to go around the train. We just crawled under it to go to each other's house. Never thought about it being a dangerous thing to do. We just, it was just in the way and it was too long to go around it. So we just crawled under it and go on. Wouldn't matter what the engine was running or not, because it would have been. We just crawled under it and went on to, to do our visit and back and forth. Mm -hmm. And we we visited a lot back and forth. Um, that was. Do you remember riding bicycles with her? Oh my yes! And you know, one time we we were on these bicycles, and we decided that we were gonna we were gonna ride out to Betty Walford's house. So we we made it fine going out there, and we we kind of took the short cut down the gravel road back there to her house. And we, we visited a while, and then we decided we'd going to come home. I think I must have been about 14, about, about that age this mm -hmm. time. But we decided, well, we'd just come on home out to the highway and up to Waldenburg and then back home that way. When we got to Waldenburg and turned to go north, that wind was blowing so hard that we could hardly even make it. About every telephone pole, we'd have to stop and warm our hands and catch our breath because we were fighting so hard against that wind. We didn't think we would ever get back home. But we finally made it. But we did a lot of bicycle riding mm -hmm. after, I think I was about nine years old and Daddy had surprised me with a brand new blue swim bicycle. Mm -hmm. And that's the one I kept for in fact, I've still got it. It's hanging out in my barn. Kind of rusty now and old, but I've still got it. <laughs> Was there a child when you were younger that you didn't like that much? Mm -hmm. I can't. I can't really remember anybody that I didn't like. Mm -hmm. I just like most everybody. Do you remember spending the night away from home as a child? Oh yeah, I stayed a lot with different different ones. I stayed a lot at Leona's. I stayed some at Alma Faye McKnight's. Um, there were, there were um, four of us girls that started out being just really best friends of my class at school. Uh, Leona and Alma Faye were, went to church with me. Mm -hmm. and, um, and Mel French, I stayed with her a lot. And they were all from church. And then my, my four best buddies from school were Betty Jean Clark and Mary Gay Keller and Janine Hall um, and I, we ran, we were together through the whole 12 years of school mm -hmm. and we would go back and forth and back and forth and they stayed at my house a lot if there was something going on at school that we all wanted to go to, they'd all stay at my house so that we could attend things at school. And as teenagers, we there was hardly a week went by that somebody didn't stay at somebody's house, mm -hmm. you know. And we had bunking parties. Oh, we had just every once in a while we'd have, have bunking parties. I don't know how Mom and Daddy put up with us, all of us, <laughs> but they just didn't seem to mind at all. In fact, if Daddy happened to uh, be at 
town or something, he'd usually bring us something back. I remember one time he'd gone to Jonesboro. They must have had a, a big sale on chips and stuff because he came back with just an armload of all different kinds of chips and and um, just nicky-nacky things like that. Mm -hmm. And we thought, boy, we'd really hit the jackpot with that. We ate all night long. <laughs> But we loved having bunking parties. I'm going to switch. Okay. My name is Tasha Drawer. I'm interviewing Ruth Lynn at her home. Today's date is January the 16th, 2008. How did your family celebrate Thanksgiving? Um, I just remember um, most Thanksgivings, all my married sisters would come home and we'd have a big Thanksgiving dinner. And then we usually always Played, played games of some sort in the afternoon. What did Daddy loved playing pitch, so if he could get four around that would play pitch, well, that's what they would do, but I never did learn to play pitch. And I was too little to play those kind of games, so I'd have to, I'd have to play something a little more simple. Uh, but there was usually somebody that would play simpler games with mm -hmm. the littler ones. Mm -hmm. What did you have to eat for Thanksgiving? What would they cook? Um, Mom always raised chickens, so we nearly always had chicken of some sort baked. Or, mm -hmm. Well, our traditional uh, dinner was fried chicken. Mm -hmm. You know, about every Sunday we had fried chicken. But uh, once in a while she'd kill an old hen and mm -hmm. bake it. So we we would have that more than we would have turkey mm -hmm. at Thanksgiving with dressing and all the trimmings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you remember doing anything on Halloween? Oh, yeah, we always went trick-or-treating on Halloween. Oh, I've got a funny story to tell about Halloween. Um, oh, girl, I pulled that. No, sir, just put it back okay. Um, this was, we were, all us girls were in the sixth grade, this bunch of girls that all ran around together that I mentioned before. And we were trying to decide if we were too old to go trick-or-treating at this time. <laughs> <laughs> but and we we messed around and messed around for a long time before we finally decided well we would go this one last time we'd go trick or treat. So we went up to Mr. Crafts. This is Catherine Crafts, uh, Catherine's sister's mom and daddy. We went up to their door and we knocked on the door. And he came to the door and we said trick or treat, you know. And he said, you know, I've given away everything that I have. But I'll tell you what, he said, I've got one thing left that I'll give you. Here it is. And he handed us a pack of cigarettes. <laughs> well, we debated a long time about whether or not we should smoke those things or take them home to Daddy. And this was a big decision for us to make. And we decided, well, we'd just go ahead and trick-or-treat some more before we decided. And we went by Mr. Densmore's and we knocked on the door. And he hollered out, you better get out of here before I shoot every one of you. Boy, it scared us to death, and we ran. That was our last stop before we ran home. We ran home. But by that time, we decided we better just give those cigarettes to Daddy. <laughs> Can you believe somebody give a bunch of kids a pack of cigarettes? <laughs> so that, ended, that was the end of our trick-or-treating. And we always had a Halloween carnival at school, always. And... And we had Halloween queens, and we would collect money, and whoever ended up with that most money would be the queen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you remember doing mm -hmm. that, Patricia? Mm -hmm. And let me see, I think I was kind of about in the 10th grade when I was the Halloween queen one year. So I must have really worked. <laughs> <laughs> what was Christmas like at your home? When I was little, all the decorations were handmade. You strung popcorn, you wrapped gumballs in tin foil, mm -hmm. you strung red berries, um, didn't have any lights, mm -mm. you know, on trees. Everything was homemade that you put on the tree. Mm -hmm. Daddy would go out and cut the tree. You know, there was a lot of woods back there then. There was all kinds of cedar trees growing back there. It was usually a cedar tree. Mm -hmm. So I guess the, the fun of it, and I don't really remember 
we always got a present, but I, I don't really remember any specific Christmas present. I remember birthday presents better than I do Christmas presents. I guess because I was the only one that was getting stuff then. But um, we always had a, a, a present. And of course it was a treat to have, when I was littler, it was a treat to have fruit. You didn't have fruit all year long like you do now. Mm -hmm. So it was a treat to have fruit at Christmas time. And uh, nuts and things like that. Those were those were just for special times. It wasn't an everyday thing that you had unless you had a tree in your yard and you had it during that particular season, you know. Mm -hmm. Did you have a big Christmas dinner or was it yeah. just opening presents? We, we usually did and uh, that's when the married kids would would come home, <coughs> you mm -hmm. know, for for either the dinner or supper, one or two. They had other in-laws that they'd have to go to for mm -hmm. for part of the day, but they would nearly always come there during during the Christmas day sometime. Mm -hmm. So we we'd have big get-togethers get then. Mm -hmm. Do you remember a story about Christmas that you remember when you were a child? Not any particular Christmas. Uh, Do you remember, did they have a community Christmas tree in the school? Yes. Tell about that, what do you remember about it? I, but I, um, I just remember it, it being there, but I can't remember much about it. I think they had a kind of a program or something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everybody's there. That's what you remember about. Uh -huh. But I can't remember yeah, much right. about that. Do you have mm -hmm. a story about a birthday you had as a child? Oh, my birthdays were always very special for me. Because uh, Mother always let me have a birthday party mm -hmm. and invite all my friends. And she always made a birthday cake. And usually all the friends stayed the night, mm -hmm. you know. And I would have from six to 15 kids, you know, at my house at, at birthday. I have several pictures of, of the birthday gatherings when I had birthdays, you mm -hmm. know, with all the kids gathered around me. And uh, a funny story about birthday, though, is one time I decided that I wanted a green cake with pink icing. So. Mama made me a green cake for my birthday with pink icing, and Daddy refused to eat it. He said he wasn't going to eat anything that was green like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember that, uh, him, him refusing to eat my birthday cake. That kind of disappointed me because I thought it was so pretty, <laughs> and he didn't eat any of it. But, um, and then the bicycle, Daddy got me that one day, one time for Christmas, and uh, I remember when I was in the ninth grade, he'd gone up to, I was trying to think of the name of that jewelry store in Jonesboro, and I can't think of it now, and bought me a birthstone ring that I thought was just gorgeous. And uh, those are the, the two that I remember. I always got, I know for Christmas or birthdays or something, I would get dolls because I always had dolls to play with. Now, Mama made all the doll clothes. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't have the bought and doll clothes, but I always had a doll to play with. And uh, so I'm sure I've got dolls at birthdays or Christmases, one of the two. But the, the two presents I remember the most were that bicycle and that ring. I thought they were both so special to get that. Because I, I had been just having to ride old hand-me-down bicycles, so that was pretty neat to have a brand new shiny blue one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who was the first president that you remember? I remember Daddy listening to um, Roosevelt. He used to have a program on the, the radio. I think they were called Fireside Chats, I believe. And I remember Daddy listening to him on the radio. Mm -hmm. The first one I remember seeing any pictures of was Truman. But I do remember Daddy listening to Roosevelt on the, on the radio. What's the thing you remember most about him? About the president? Mm -hmm. Hmm. Uh, other than just the, him being on the radio, and is all that I can really remember. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm when you were in school, were there any famous people, like movie stars or singers, that you really, really liked? Oh my! There were several. When when I was in high school, especially, you know, I remember listening a lot to. Doris Day and Bing Crosby and K-Star and Patti Page and, 
And then that was the that was the time of big bands. You had mm -hmm. Glenn Miller and Guy Lombardo and Tommy Dorsey and and uh, uh, Dean Dean Martin was was big during that time too. Um, And that was the kind of music we had, kind of that big band music, uh, like Sentimental Journey and, and um, Hey There, You With the Stars in Your Eyes, and, and uh, uh, Sentimental Journey, and I was trying to think of some of the songs. But that was the type of music that, that we had during that time. I remember Glenn Miller playing in the mood and um, it's funny how your mind kind of goes blank when you're trying to think and that but there were so many good good songs at that time uh, there's a, a station at Fairfield Bay when we go to the lake that we listen to a lot that play a lot of those we call them golden oldies <laughs> Tell me about what high school was like for you. I had the most fun in high school. Um, and I think it was because of, of all the friends I had, you know. We, we just, um, like I said before, we got together so often and spent the night with each other and just had the best time just doing nothing, you know. Just being silly and, and, and talking and laughing and and uh, we'd, we'd, we'd dress up in silly things and take pictures and and uh, tell jokes and uh, just just having a good time what we thought was a good time I, probably today they wouldn't think all the things that we did was fun but we thought it was great we just had a good time do you have any of those pictures that you took whenever yeah. Yeah, you do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Was there a teacher at high school that you really liked? I really liked Mr. Smith. He was just a lot of fun, I thought. And we did, he was the one that was our senior sponsor, and he also was the one that kind of sponsored plays. We'd have plays and uh, that we'd put on. Every year we had a play. And... Uh, I know one of them was Betty Jane from Pumpkin Lane. I remember that one because I was Betty Jane. And, uh, and um, I, think it, I think it was just the 11th and 12th grade that did plays. And we did, and we did them every year. And then on my senior year, Mr. Smith even wrote a play for us six girls to do. It was, it was Paula Manning and Beverly Fryman and then the three that I mentioned before and mm -hmm. me. And he knew that we buddied a lot together and that they were at my house so much because if there was a ball game, they stayed at my house and we'd all walk to the ball game together. Mm -hmm. We didn't have a car, so we walked everywhere we went. When we went to the movies, we walked to the movie, mm -hmm. you know. So we walked everywhere we went. And since I was the only one that lived in town, except for Beverly, and Beverly's folks didn't much like all of us there, so we didn't stay there very much. We stayed, I think it was Buster that kind of put a squelch to that. So everybody landed at my house. And uh, so he wrote a play about uh, us getting ready to go on our senior trip. <coughs> and and it, it took place at, at our house, and it was real cute, I thought. So anyway, he was one of my favorites. Was there a teacher that you didn't like that much? Mm, not really. There were some that we thought were kind of odd, but <laughs> didn't really dislike them. What, <laughs> the teachers that you thought were odd, what, what was odd about them? Well, I remember one was Miss Ramey. She was our commercial teacher that taught bookkeeping, typing, shorthand, that, that type of thing. She's, she was kind of a sloppy dressed person. And her bra straps would, <laughs> would slip down over her shoulder. She was always tugging. She was always reaching in there and tugging those bra straps up. 
you know, way down in her blouse, she'd reach down and bring those bra straps back up. <laughs> and uh, we would just make so much fun of her for doing that. <laughs> so she was kind of an odd one. <laughs> When you were a teenager, what were the coolest fashions and, you know, the hairdos and... Okay, hairdos were um, not a whole lot different from what they they are now. We, it did, we weren't in the era when they were doing all that teasing and all. Mm -hmm. it, so, you, some of them wore them kind of short, some of them were long, they were nearly always a little bit of curl on the end, mm -hmm. sometimes straight, but mostly curl on the end if they were long. And if they were short, a lot of them kept perms in their hair, or if they were real short, they might just be kind of straight, mm -hmm. you know. So it was kind of similar to a lot of styles that we have now. Did you wear the skirts with the, I forget what the skirts are called, but did you wear skirts, was that what the style was when you were? The skirts with what? what, what just what, just what skirts. Outfits, what yeah. Oh, well, mostly it was uh, it was mostly skirts and mm -hmm. blouses and sweaters. But by the time I was a teenager, teenager we were in jeans. Mm -hmm. But the, we didn't wear them long like you did. We rolled them up oh. about three or four rolls till they were about like this. Oh, but they were always rolled up two or three rolls. Oh, okay. The jeans were. Mm -hmm. were you and then we wore, we wore what they call pedal pushers oh. that were just kind of below the knee. You would call them probably capris, yeah. But we called them pedal pushers. Mm -hmm. but Were you allowed to wear those to school? We could wear yes, we could wear the jeans to school. But now, when I was in grade school, I never wore pants. And I remember Mama making me wear these long white stockings, and I hated those things. I was so glad when I could get a, away from wearing those long white stockings. And I had to wear those, I think, for two, at least two years before she let me go bare-legged, you know, mm -hmm. to school. But we always wore dr dresses when I was in grade school. But by the time we got to high school, we could wear jeans. So, but now when I got, went to college, my first year to go to college, the only place you could wear pants was to gym class. And you had to be going to gym class and coming home from, coming back from gym class if you had on pants. Mm -hmm. You could not wear them any other time. My first year of college. Do you remember having a favorite outfit or something you liked to wear? Mm -hmm. I remember one skirt that it was probably about the first bought and skirt that Mama gave me, and it was um, it was plaid. It was brown and blue plaid, and I had a brown sweater that went with it. And I thought it just looked so sharp when I put that on because it was all bought. And, and Mama had made most of my clothes. So I thought that was really a pretty sharp outfit. And it was just a pleated skirt, you know, just a plain pleated skirt and just a plain pullover sweater. But I thought it was very special. Mm -hmm. And my mother made, made the most beautiful prom dress when I was a senior in high school. We had gone to Jonesboro shopping for me a prom dress. And we saw this one that was so pretty, I saw. It was it was light blue and it had this netting on the 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 outside and it had all these kind of ruffle things and things all on the, the skirt kind of uh, net that was was kind of draped with the flowers on each little place, you know, or or I can't remember exactly what it did look like. But Anyway, it was just really pretty, I thought. And Mama said, well, she said, I could probably make that for half what that would cost. So she said, I'll just, um, I'll just remember what it looks like and I'll just go home and make it for you. And she did and it turned out beautiful. I think I've got a picture of it. So I'll have to show you later. Mm -hmm. But it was really a pretty dress. What about your social life? What was some of the most fun things that you did? Well, the, I, uh, like I said, all of us girls could just think of the most fun things to do. You know, Mary Gay was about the only one that could get a car. So when we were teenagers and she came in, we'd run around in her car. Mm -hmm. We thought that was just great fun to, to run around in her car, you know. And uh, probably the most daring thing that we did was we would, uh, 
she knew how to unplug the speedometer. Uh -huh. And she was just supposed to come to Wiener and then park and then go back home. But she had learned how to unplug that speedometer. So we'd just run to Joe's bar and we'd run to, to Harris Bar and we'd pull our money to buy gas to put back in it so that there wouldn't be any gas gone. Mm -hmm. And we just had the most fun just running all over the place. <laughs> And her parents never knew it. <laughs> or if they did, they didn't say anything. Because <laughs> she'd always get it plugged back in just before she went back home. <laughs> but we had a good time. What do you remember about Grundins? Well, that was just the hot spot to go, go swimming. Now, we did have a rice pool back in a field behind our house, but that water was cold as ice. So it wasn't too much fun to be in it, but it was fun to go to Grundon's and go swimming. But, um, uh, and as a teenager, it was fun to go there and dance because they had this jukebox and they had this big floor that you could, that you could dance. And of course they sold refreshments and, and all that. But as a teenager, that's what we'd do a lot. We'd go to Grundon's and, and uh, put what money that we had in that jukebox and just dance up a storm. So that was, that was more fun even than the swimming, we thought. What was the movie theater like as a teenager? We had the Victory Theater there at Wiener. And uh, it had a balcony and then a main floor. And um, at that time, the blacks and whites were separated. And the blacks went upstairs to the balcony and the whites sat, sat down on the floor part. And uh, there were three three sections of seats, so there were two aisles that, that went down there. And uh, they had some pretty good movies there that mm -hmm. we, we'd go and see. What kind of music did you used to listen to as a teenager? Oh, I think I covered that earlier. That was kind of that big band music that we, that we listened to a lot. And uh, we had Dean Martin and, and uh, Bing Crosby and Frankie Lane and um, Patty Page and K Star and Rosemary Clooney, and uh, that's George Clooney's mother, by the way. And she was a great singer. She had some really pretty songs. I remember one of them that I really liked was Wheel of Fortune that she sang. So there were a lot of a lot of good music, good dance and music. What dances were popular when you were a teenager? We did a lot of jitterbugging and two-stepping. And then um, to get warmed up, a lot of times we'd do the Mexican hat dance or the bunny hop. Uh, those were the main, those were four of the main things that we, mm -hmm. we did. Who taught you how to drive? Uh, Helen started out teaching me. And then I finished practicing on Bobby's car. But I started out with Helen teaching me on a, a manual shift car. And uh, because we never did have a car. Mm -hmm. Daddy's uh, health condition didn't allow us to have, he couldn't drive. So we, we never had a car. So uh, I had to wait until I was a teenager and learned on Helen's car. What do you remember about the first car you owned? That would have been the one that Bobby bought when he got out of service. He thought it was so slick. He had a bright yellow Ford, brand new bright yellow Ford convertible. <laughs> and he was really dooting around town in there. So when he married me, then that became mine too. So that was my first car. <laughs> Tell me about someone you admired or looked up to when you were young. Mm -hmm. Other than parents. Mm -hmm. um, and other than sisters. Um, which probably had to have been somebody in church then. Or maybe an uncle. I always thought an awful lot of my Uncle Kenneth and Uncle Stanley, 
Miss Thelma was always kind of a neat person, I thought. Miss Jessie, Huber, Miss Thelma Hogue. I don't think I had any one particular person. Mm -hmm. What is your most vivid memory about World War II? Well, my brother had to go, you know, and he was mm -hmm. killed in World War II, so that would have been my most vivid memory. How, and, did, how did your family find out about his death? A uh, telegram. It was brought to the house. I remember, I vividly remember this, that when, when they brought the telegram, and I don't know who brought it, it must have been someone from the depot, huh? But anyway, whoever brought it, I remember Mama opening that up and reading it and just started screaming and crying like her heart would absolutely break in two. And uh, so that was very vivid in my memory as her reaction of when she found out that he was killed. How, how old were you when that I was happened? seven. Mm -hmm. I was seven years old. Did you go to college? Yes, I did. Where'd you go? I went to Arkansas State. What was your major? Elementary education. Uh, do you have any stories that you remembered from going to college? Well, I went one year, and that's when, when Bobby said he was chasing me. Yeah. He chased me all over that campus. <laughs> and <laughs> finally, finally did catch me, and I, I married during that, we, we got married during that first year. And um, then he, we went back to Flint. You think He's, it's going to work out? Yeah, I think maybe it might. I've, I've put up with him now for 51 years, so I think it might be a, a lasting thing. Yeah. So anyway, uh, we went back to Flint then that summer and worked, and, and I got pregnant, and then I had two children, and I, so I didn't go back to school. Mm -hmm. Bobby went ahead and finished. He finished in, in 59, and he started teaching, and I know one day I was talking to Mother, and I said, you know, if I could find someone that I could really trust to babysit, I would just go back to school and go ahead and get my degree. And she said, well, I'll keep those girls for you, and I, I told her Daddy was kind of a handful to take care of then with his problems and I said oh you can't take care of them and take care of daddy too oh she said yes I can she said they'd just be company for both of us so I, I thought well I'll try it one semester and I'll just get morning classes and we'll see how it works out so I just took the 12 hours and I just took morning classes and they seemed to both enjoy having the girls there mm -hmm. and so then I gradually increased my hours and and my time at school, but I still tried to get most of it in a block of time that I could, wouldn't have to be gone the whole day long. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it worked out great. They they enjoyed the girls, and the girls enjoyed being there. And I fa finally managed to get that degree after, and I made it in three more years. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was kind of kind of hard to go to school and and have a family and. Um, I'm going to tell this off on Bobby. He never was much to help around the house. <laughs> so I had the two girls to take care of and the meals to cook and the house to clean and the ironing to do and the studying to do, so it kept me pretty busy, way into the hours, wee hours of the morning sometimes. Mm -hmm. So it was a little bit of a struggle, but I finally made it got my degree. <laughs> Tell me about an object you have other than photos that is very important to you. Tell me that one more time. Tell me about an object you have other than photos oh, that's gosh. important to you. I have quilts and that mother made and crocheted things that she made that um, will always be quite dear to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your first teaching job. My first job was at Hickory Ridge. And uh, I taught the second grade that year, and that was the first year that Micah went to school, so she, she went with me um, to, to school that year. And uh, I had some women there that 
were really checking on me. I found out kind of toward the end of the year. They were comparing how their, what their children were learning to what some children were learning in the Wynn School District. So at the end, though, they did tell me that they appreciated what I had done and, and their children were just up to par, just like the cousins that went to the Wynn School. So mm -hmm. I guess it all worked out all right. <laughs> Of course, I was scared too that I wasn't maybe doing everything I should, so I worked real hard to try to, to do everything just right. Yeah. What is one of the funniest things you can ever remember happening in your classroom? Well, I'll tell you this one story. This, I was teaching at Cash at the time, and um, I was teaching first grade, and we didn't have kindergarten, so they came straight, straight to school from home mm -hmm. and at that time not too many of the mothers worked and we had this one little boy we had windows that were kind of low and there was a bookshelf all under the window and I had this one little boy that every time he he, he would just watch out the window and every time his dad would pass by on the highway he would be out of that seat and out of that window before I could even say scat and I'd have to go chase him down and get him back, <laughs> back in the classroom and his Daddy made a trip just about every day up on that highway, so I was chasing him just about every day. And this went on for several months before he finally would stay in his seat when his daddy went by. And then I had another little boy that year. Uh, the bathrooms were not connected to the building. They were out on the, the side, and you had to go, oh, probably the length of from here to, to my kitchen, probably mm -hmm. about 20, 30 feet to mm -hmm. the bathrooms. And uh, we were in our little reading circle, and we had been reading, and when we got up, I noticed there was a puddle in this one place. And I said, this little boy's name was Mark, and I said, Mark, why didn't you tell me that you needed to go to the bathroom? And it was, it was rainy outside, and he looked up at me, and he said, well, because I didn't want to get wet. <laughs> of course, he was wet anyway, but, <laughs> but he didn't want to get wet. <laughs> Tell me about something that happened while you were teaching that touched your heart. Hmm. I'm trying to think. I have a lot of good memories of uh, classroom things. Um, that touched my heart, I'm not for sure. I, I remember uh, the, the one class that I had that had uh, Candace, Hesse, and Sabra, uh, Jones, and um, Kaki sent me, and some of those girls, they always loved to perform. And they, every, every day, they were wanting to sing. And then I had a group of boys that year. There was a, a Brian Kiefer, and Don Larden, and uh, I'm trying to think of some of the others. Anyway, these group of boys like to perform too. Mm -hmm. And they would bring big sheets of cardboard to take out to the playground to practice on, and they'd practice this break dancing. <laughs> and so I, it finally got to where they were just wanting to perform all the time, not do anything else. So I had to make a little rule. I said, well, every Tuesday afternoon, the last 30 minutes will be performance time. So. Every Tuesday afternoon, those, that group of girls and that group of boys would do their singing and dance routines. And they had it down pat. Those girls would practice. They'd do little routines, too, with their dance, with their singing, you know. Mm -hmm. And they were the cutest things when they performed like that. And uh, I'll just never forget that, that year because that was so cute, the way they wanted to do all the time, and uh, 
I had another little boy that was just a little rascal. And uh, this this is a time when that song about uh, that's my my story and I'm sticking to mm -hmm. it. There'd been a big ruckus. This was Randy Wooten. You, you might even remember him. There was a big ruckus sound on the playground, and so we were trying to sort it out in the classroom. And Randy was telling me this big spiel about what had happened, you know, and he got finished and he said, and that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Doesn't that sound just like him? <laughs> uh, uh, I just, uh, I enjoyed, I enjoyed teaching and, and enjoyed the, the boys and girls that I had. There were just, just a very, very few that were such pills that you couldn't enjoy, but that was few and far between. How did teaching change from the first year you taught to the last year you taught? Well, there was quite a quite a bit of change. Um, the first few years of, well, several years of teaching, um, you weren't required to do so many extra things. Uh, your main focus was on reading, and and math and and being able to write and just do basic things so you did a really good job of teaching basic things which i, th I think was real helpful uh, because once you get the basic things down then you can go ahead and branch out to other things at the end of my teaching um, they wanted all this these other things brought in to where you really didn't have enough time for your basics to get a good foundation going. I taught third grade mostly. And of course it got to where discipline was a little bit uh, harder. You didn't have the parents uh, behind you like you did in my early years of teaching um, to help control classroom situations, you know. So that was maybe a little bit more difficult even though I didn't have a a great lot of discipline problems anyway, but mm -hmm. that was that was a change there too. Do you have a do you remember a student that you had that you you'll probably never forget? Oh goodness, I have several of them. I'll tell this funny story about Franklin Pickle. He never <laughs> he he never he never wanted to do anything scholastically, that, you know. And one day I had, I had said, well, let's just uh, get our books and and uh, we're gonna do this spelling lesson right quick. And then I looked at the clock and I said, oh no, we're not gonna have time to do anything, just forget about that. And he jumped up out of that seat and he leaped up and he jumped on me, had his legs around my waist and my, his arms around my neck and gave me a big old kiss on the cheek. He was just so happy. <laughs> that he didn't have to do any more work. <laughs> and before I knew it, there he was. <laughs> so that's something I won't forget. <laughs> I've never had a student do that before. <laughs> um, what did you like the most about teaching? Um, I, I, th I think it was just um, the interaction with the students. Um, and seeing the different personalities and and uh, seeing the, the accomplishments that they could make. And, um, that's probably probably what I enjoyed the most. What did you like the least about it? Grading papers. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hated to do that. Mm -hmm. That took up too much good time. <laughs> Would you recommend teaching as a career today to a young person? I still think it's a good profession. Tell me a story about something that happened to you at one of your first jobs. Um, Did you ever have a job besides teaching before you? I didn't have another okay. job. All right, then you can skip that. How did you meet your husband? Oh, he he just he just was there just chasing. <laughs> <laughs> he first of all, uh, 
Well, he had he had come he, when he got out of service. He was driving around Wiener in his convertible, you know, thinking he was really pretty sharp. And he came then and asked me for a date, but I was I was uh, dating Ron Hogg at the time, and I wasn't too interested in Bobby, so I didn't <laughs> go ahead and, and go out with him. And then after I graduated from high school, I went to my sister Alice's in in Iowa and spent that summer with her. And I came back, and I had been gone all summer long, so I hadn't made very many contacts, you know, by me being gone all summer. And all my girlfriends had dates, and there I was at home, no date, and here comes Bobby and asked me out. And I thought, why not? I'm going to have to sit here anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so sure enough, I did. I went ahead and went out. We went to a movie and uh, then went out to, there was a little barbecue place. I can't think of the name of it out there on G Street that the kids always went to after movies in Jonesboro. And we went out there and had a barbecue. And then um, I think it was maybe the next week we started, or the week after that, we st I guess it was the week after that, we started to school. And every time I turned around, there he was. <laughs> so he finally just wore, you down. wore me down, <laughs> wore me right down. <laughs> Till I finally had to go ahead and say, I do. <laughs> hmm. Tell me about when you got married. Well, I, I, I didn't think that mother and daddy would approve too much of me getting married quite that young. And besides, they were footing my bill. <laughs> and so we decided we'd just slip off and get married. And we wouldn't even say anything about it till we got out of school. But somehow it, um, it got out that we were, so we had to go ahead and tell about it. And then we had to go ahead and rent us a little apartment and pay for our, pay for our own way, and that was kind of hard. <laughs> but we tried to get by without having to do that because we had it pretty well made till, till we had to start <laughs> till we had to start paying our own way. <laughs> So we went to the First Christian Church there in Jonesboro, and the minister there married us. Um, and so that was that. So we had no big wedding. We just slipped off and did that. Is there a family recipe that throughout the years is always found on the table at family celebrations or dinners? We always had fried chicken. Mama always had chickens. When I was little, they were just running loose out in the yard out in the chicken, chicken yard. And then as I was a teenager, he had, he had, she had all these brooders that she raised chickens in from babies up to frying size. And then she'd sell them either, either just as they were or she'd dress them mm -hmm. and sell them like that. So we always had chickens. So mm. that, was, that was one of the main things we always had was fried chicken. Do you still have fried chicken today for big celebrations or? No, because Mama's not here anymore. So we don't do that. Tell me about something that you have, that has been passed down through your family that means a lot to you. You know, I really don't have anything other than what's been passed down by Mother because the house burned and burned a lot of stuff there in 68 that she had. and. I'm told that Grandma Leach's house burned too, and she lost a lot of stuff. So um, I do have quilts and crochet things and cruel embroidery pictures that that Mother made that I've kept, and and they'll be passed down mm -hmm. to my children. Tell what you remember about the business that you were in Wiener when you were young. That were in Wiener when you were young. Okay, that was the stores that we mentioned before, like Mr. D. Goods and Miss Sophie's Sister's Dime store that you could get all kinds of little things in. Walk, down, walk down the side. What do you remember being from one corner to the next? Okay, along the side where the city hall is now. Mr. D. Goods' store was first, and I think, and then Miss Sophie's, I think, and then Miss Allen had a dress shop 
I believe it was next to Miss Sophie's, and then Miss but Brian Stell's drugstore, then Harry's barbershop, Harry Gilmore's barbershop, and Irene and Arlen McCoy had a restaurant. Now that's what I'm remembering, but I'm not for sure whether that's right or not. What and then Buster Fryman had a service station. What do you remember being on the other side? I remember uh, Elmer having a barbershop later, this was later, I don't remember until later, Elmer had that barber shop over there and Wilbur had a grocery store. Wilbur Barnoff had a grocery store. And uh, that's, that's what I, and then, uh, you know, Miss Pip Pippinger's had that telephone office on down from there, across from the church. What do you remember um, being on the other side of the railroad track from okay. one quarter to the next? Uh, now this would have been later too, when Franklin Huber had a grocery store on the corner, and the post office was over there, and um, I'm trying to think of what else was over there. There was an implement company, wasn't there? International place over there. Um, on down, Uncle Chris had a Uncle Chris Berger had a service station where Ronnie Hatcher has his place now. Um, and at one time, Ray Fowler had a, a store there on the, the corner, or, or Ray's daddy had a, no, Ray was the one that yeah. had the grocery store there on that corner. And Miss Lawson had a restaurant over there at one time. Of course, all of these probably weren't there at the same time. That's, that's what I'm remembering right now. Tell about the first television you remember seeing. The first one I ever saw was at, at uh, you and me and Ben McKnight's. Jim had bought it for him. And uh, we were just uh, in awe, you know, sitting there watching that. The picture wasn't worth a dime, but, <laughs> but we thought it was really something else, you know. And it was several years after that before uh, we ever had a television. So that was quite unique for that time for, for them to have that television. Mm -hmm. Of the inventions or discoveries that have been made in our lifetime, which has been your favorite? Well, let's see. There would have been TV, there would have been cell phones, computers. Let's see. I've probably got more use out of the TV than anything. Why the TV? Well, you know, there used to be really great programs on there. there there's, there there's, there's not very much on that's worth watching anymore. Mm -hmm. But there used to be good family shows. There, it wasn't anything that you would be afraid to have your children sit right there and watch. You know, mm -hmm. there wasn't all this violence and immorality and all that on TV that goes on now. And so there were just good, good family shows that had good family values. And uh, so you didn't mind, you didn't mind sitting and watching TV with your children. And then there were, at that time, by the time my kids, you know, grew up, there were a lot of those good educational programs on too. Mm -hmm. That they could watch, like Captain Kangaroo. I remember the kids watching Captain Kangaroo and getting quite a lot out of that. Of course, anything can be abused, and TV could be too. But. Uh, I think it's been up until they started putting so much violence and uh, graphic sex things on TV, I think it's been a good thing. Is there an invention or discovery that is in use today that you don't like? I just don't really care anything about computers, but I'm going to have to try to learn more about them, I guess. But I really think that I'm not that electronically minded. <laughs> I think maybe I was born a generation too l too late, you know. I don't I, I just can't seem to get into that computer business. Uh, other than World War Two, tell about what has been the biggest world event in your lifetime, one so important that you remember exactly where you were at when you learned it. I remember uh, the first year I taught school 
that um, is when we were in the classroom and somebody came in and said, President Kennedy's been shot. And that just closed down everything and we all gathered where there was a TV so we could watch the events the rest of the day of that shooting. Mm -hmm. Although most people don't like to pat themselves on the back, what is something you've done or accomplished in life that you're proud of? Well, I hope I've made a difference in the life of my students. And I think I have some because as uh, they've grown up and even had families of their own, they've come up to me and wished that I was back teaching so I could teach their children. And um, I know one in particular, I remember Mindy uh, Thurble, who used to be Grubbs now, came up to me and she said, you're the reason that I went into teaching. And I've had other kids that would come up and say, oh, you were my favorite teacher. I just enjoyed your class. And when I hear things like that, it makes me feel like I have accomplished something because I know that they were learning at the same time they were enjoying school. Mm -hmm. And that was important to me. I wanted them to be able to enjoy being there as well as learning. I have a question. Uh, can you tell me about an encounter that you might have had with your husband's beehives? <laughs> oh, I've got to tell you that story. Bobby had had back surgery, and um, it was a really windy night, this particular night, and he had gotten up the next morning, and he had beehives all in the woods, a little patch of woods that's back at the back of this field where our house is, and he looked back there, and he could see that, that some of those beehives had been blown over. So he comes to me, and he says, Ruthie, he said, would you go up there and straighten up those beehives for me? Because if you don't, they're just going to all die. And I said, well, I'm not going to go up there and straighten up those beehives. They'll, I'll get stung all to pieces. No, he said, they're, they, they're real docile this time of year. He said, you, all you have to do is just go up there and just lift the hive real easy and just set it right over on the other hive. They won't bother you a bit. So I said, okay, of course he couldn't drive either because he'd had this surgery, So, but he wanted to go along. So we get in the car and we drive up there and we get out and I walk over and I real carefully pick up this beehive. Did you put a, a, a uniform on, a suit? Did you have a suit on? Oh, not this time. Yeah. Okay. This comes later. Okay. I carefully pick up this beehive and I start to put it over here on the the the, mm -hmm. the, super. the super where it's supposed to go, and I backed up and there was a log there, and I fell backwards <laughs> over that log. That that thing landed on me. The, the bees were swarming all over me, and I started running and toward Bobby to for help. And Bobby says, "Don't run toward me." <laughs> And so I, I, there I was, you know, so I started running the other way and trying to get them off. And I thought, well, I've got them all off. And I got in the car and I started down the road and I felt one crawling down my back. I jumped out of the car, but I forgot to put it in park. So <laughs> here the car was going down with Bobby and Bobby hollered, hey, you know, here, here the car was going down there. And I was trying to get the feet. And I had to run and catch the car, jump back in the car come back to the house and I was so mad and, well, and, and you know what he said to me and I, when I backed over that and I and, and he said well he said if you hadn't been as clumsy as a three-legged elephant that wouldn't have happened so I was so mad by the time I came back to the house you could probably just see smoke coming out of my ears I was so mad and I said well those big guys can just all die I don't care if they all die you know and, and then I got to feeling sorry for him because I knew he couldn't do anything about it. He said, you can put on your my big suit and go up there, and that way you'd be sure and be safe. So I got to feeling sorry for him. I said, oh, okay, I'll go up and I'll put on his big suit. Well, I put on his big suit, and the crouch came down to my knees, and I put on this helmet, you know, 
and all this stuff was just swallowing me. It was so big. And I got in the car and I started out and that hat kept falling down <laughs> on my eyes and I couldn't see where I was going. And Bobby kept saying, watch where you're going. You're going to go in the ditch. You know, all the, all the way up there. He was coaching me and I couldn't even see where I was going because I had this thing over me. And so then we got back up there and we got parked and I and I got the the um, beast. <laughs> I think I left over. I'll tell it now. I got the supers, the things back on the the supers, and got them all stacked up. And I left out a part that that I've got to tell. I've got to back up. When I started running, the first time, and getting getting because this is what everybody. When, when we told this to the preacher, I thought he'd fall out of his chair. When I started running, and Bobby wouldn't help me any. He told me to, to not come toward him. And there were bees all in my clothes. I first of all pulled off my shirt and threw it down. And then I still feel them, and I pulled on my bra, and I threw it down. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I was just stripping out because I had these bees all in there, you know. So... Uh, so anyway, there I was. With I, I didn't take my pants off, but I did have all my tops off. There I was running, slapping all these bees off, and I shook my stuff all out. I thought, and then put them back on, and that's when I felt felt the bee again. When I just went off and left the car running on with Bobby in it, and nobody to steer. But, so anyway, I came back and I got the bee suit on, and went back up there and got that all done. And then, sure enough. I felt a bee again after I got back in the car. And I had to get back out and I had to strip off again and, and get that get that bee out of my clothes. So we finally got the bee settled and we got back home. But that was some ordeal. And I don't know that I've forgiven Bobby to this day for, for the, the ugly remark he made when I was wanting to get out of that situation. She brings that three-legged elephant up about every week. <laughs> she was mad. <laughs> she came to school and told that story. <laughs> she, that's the reason I had to ask. Oh, another funny story is Melanie was living up here in this farmhouse and she had a horse that somebody had given her that had a broken leg and she just knew she could get it well. And she had it up in a stirrup, you know, for the longest and finally let it kind of get down, but it was always kind of crippled. And she called here one morning and she said that that horse was in the ditch and she couldn't get it out. And so I said, well, I'll, I'll come up and see if I can help you. And um, so I went up there and we tugged and we pulled and we tugged and we pulled. and and didn't think we were ever going to get it out. And finally, about the time we gave up, it, we got it, it on its own, jumped out of the ditch. Well, I came back home, and I was going to be late for school because there I was all nasty again and everything. And I called Mr. Rao, and I said, Mr. Rao, you're not going to believe this. I know that you've probably never heard this story before, but I'm going to be late today because I had to get a horse out of the ditch. <laughs> And he just died laughing. He couldn't believe it. He thought I was just making it up. But it was really a true story. So I was late for school that day because I had to get a horse out of a ditch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. it's funny things happen. Tell me about the biggest lesson that life has taught you, a lesson that would help a young person live a better life. Um... Well, I would say probably foremost to put your faith in God and let that be your guide. And as a result of that, you're probably going to be a more loving and kinder person. Um, you need to always be true to yourself. Um, that would probably be my, maybe my main thing to say. Okay. Do you know anything about the Legion Hut? Yes, I do. Um, my daddy was instrumental in really developing the, the American Legion 
organization there in Wiener. He just worked diligently to get members to uh, form that, to be a part of that organization. And he was very proud of his membership in that and a, a, quite a leader in that, in that movement. And um, I was trying to think back. I know he's just been at that at the very beginning and helped with anything that was going on there. Um, Helen said that used to they'd have movies there and he would be the last one out of there and he'd always make sure that all the candy wrappers were picked up and everything was done. And I can remember in my time when he was always see after it and make sure everything was put back like it should be and, and the repairs made on it that should be made and he was just a, a dedicated legionnaire and I just thought that needed to be mentioned. Do you uh, have a picture of that legion hut? You know, I don't think I do. I find couldn't. One. I couldn't find one. I can't find anybody. Mm -hmm. What did he? What? Uh, what did he serve in? Did he was in World War One, okay. and I have a picture of him in his uniform, in his World War One uniform. Was this? Uh, was this? How far after World War Two did he start working on that? Or was it before that? The Legion Hut and the American Legion there in Wayne. Oh, I I think it must have been before. way before that because. Okay. Um, even Al, even Dorothy remembers them having square dances in there and mm -hmm. him calling the okay. square dances. So that Legion hut must be really, yeah. must have really been old. 